Unique yet common sense opinions on sports. This is Jeff Allen Sports Talk. All right, it is my pleasure to welcome to this week's program the student of the game. And he also has more media gigs than anybody I know. We welcome Kyle Nash from Black and Gold Banneret, A7B in Sports, uh, the Jaguar Report. What am I leaving out? Black and Gold Banneret, three point conversion. You said A7B in. You got most of them, not to mention the Student of the Game podcast and the Duval Dive that I do every week as well. So there you go. All right. So yeah, I, I, I need to get a bigger scorecard to keep up with all this. So <laughs> Man, this is how I do it. I, you know, I, I have a lot of alarms set on my phone that go off every day, Jeff Allen. Let me tell you. <laughs> well, I have good news for you. This is a Taylor Swift, Travis Kelsey free podcast. There's no discussion of that going on here. I think that's a win for everybody, don't you, Jeff? Totally. That's why we're keeping it free of that. So there you go. <laughs> All right. So let's talk UCF first. And, of course, uh, now that the dust has settled from the debacle of Saturday against Baylor with the uh, the 28-point lead blown and the game lost, where do you assess where the team is right now, not just after this game, but at the season to date in the Big 12? I mean, listen, I, I don't mean to be this guy, but it's funny how expectations ebb and flow. First of all, um, I might need to start charging a rate between Eric Lopez on the post game for night shift with the black and gold banneret. Mark Moses is talking about bringing me on Friday on his show. Now I'm here with you. I need to start charging hourly rates for therapy sessions after that <laughs> long. And I get it. It was devastating stuff. 26 to nothing in the fourth quarter. Where it's, it's insane. Um, I think this this is, in the words of Coach Malzahn after the game, this is a tough lesson. But you know, first of all, you know coaches are in trouble when they start talking life lessons. It's like, uh oh, here we are, you know. <laughs> but there's an element that he's right. UCF as a program was going to hit a mark like this. Did I think it would be historically crazy? No. But going from scrappy, constant underdog to making things happen to being team dominating other powerful team program, I should say, and, 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 and not expecting the bus to be started just because you're up big, those days are gone, okay? And I mean, no disrespect to these programs, but this isn't, you know, this isn't Kent State football Villanova, which who knows, they may come back for vengeance on the basketball court. That's a whole other question. <laughs> but, you know, with all of that in mind, those days are over. And these guys didn't know it yet. And I know there's a number of conspiracy theories, and Jeff, it's never any one thing. But I, I think this was a mentality edge. They, 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 the players, I don't want to say they went home a little bit. Uh, defensive coordinator Addison Will, Williams commented he could have been more aggressive with the play calling later in the game. And I could get into some of the statistical and, and, and breakdown things, which I did mention in my night class on the black and gold banneret.com. He's got the bell. All right. <laughs> um, so w with all that in mind, like in that article, and, and to Addison Williams' credit, he says that, but I'll get to this in a minute. Um, but there's so much there that the program needed a lesson like this. A lesson like this was coming. I just didn't even was going to think it was going to be like that. And, and that's where I'll start with that whole situation. Yeah. Well, and you talk about the coaching, and I kind of like we'll lay this at the feet of the coaching staff. You know, because yeah, they had a 21 point lead for a long time yeah. and 21 point leads are nothing in football anymore. I mean, they evaporate just as fast as the leads are gained sometimes. And we saw that in the fourth quarter. Uh, so, you know, the frustration with Gus, you know, is he calling the play still? You know, I think, you know, that's, uh, that's something people are wondering. Uh, you know, they've had some bad losses uh, over the last couple of years, you know, with, with Navy last year. And, you know, the bowl game against Duke was not a, not a very good performance. Well, um, that's a whole other situation there. There were that. I, listen, I'm Thomas glad Duke's Castellanos, doing better this year. Thank God. Cause <laughs> yeah, it, exactly. Thomas Castellanos had no business taking the field at all in that game. He wasn't ready. And I think we're seeing in Boston um, that he's, a lot of his action is gimmick and running and less throwing, which is what John Rice Plumley and um, Timmy McLean were until Darren Hinshaw got a hold of him. Let, mm. let, 
let, let's address the game at hand first, okay? Um, is it at the feet of coaching? To some extent, sure. Gus isn't calling plays, but what was said was that he's helping dictate tempo. If you're not familiar with tempo yet in this offense, um, that's a whole other question. This guy wrote the book on the no huddle. If you're coming to this, literally, by the way, Jeff, yes. if you're coming to this program not expecting to move fast and you're not locked in to move fast, maybe that's the coaching aspect, but it's hard for me to do it that way. Coach Williams is saying he felt like he should have been more aggressive. Here's the part that drops to me, Jeff Allen. Part of it was the victimhood of domination. Air quotes, victimhood of domination. Here we are. The time of possession was Baylor 35, 35 minutes of a 60-minute content. That's actually 35 and a half if you really want to get technical. 35 to 31, right? Yeah. 24 and a half minutes-ish, UCF has the ball meaning the defense is on the field for that long. And yeah. when this defense is what it is, we saw the linebackers get exposed against Kansas State, right? 165 yards receiving to non-wide receiver targets against Kansas State. And we saw DJ Giddens look like an All-American. Not saying he's bad. I just don't know that he's 200-yard ground game good. He's okay? a dude, though. He's a dude, yeah. Oh, yeah, no yeah. doubt. And that the, the real thing that was hitting even to me, I didn't get a chance to watch a lot of film. Kansas State's offensive line, amazing. But we'll yeah. leave that over there, right? I say all that to say the linebackers aren't the strength of this defense. Jeff, there are times when the DBs let long balls get by them against Kent State. The DBs are not the strength of this defense. The strength of this defense isn't even the defensive ends as much as I like Josh Salskar and uh, Tremont Morris Brash. The defensive tackles, everybody, we're, we're using the term he's a dude. Everybody there is a dude. Even the young man, Johnny, uh, Johnny Walker, is getting in there and hitting fools for tackles for loss. In the game in question, I might add, in the Baylor game there too, right? But even with all that rotation, even with all the depth they have there, 35 minutes and you're relying on them to carry it for that long, fatigue is inevitable. Yeah. Those are the – listen, I, I could use it. I'm an off offensive lineman. I'm in the trenches. It's our words. Those fat guys are being asked to do that like that for that long of a time. Some's, you, you got to get something from somewhere. Now, yeah. let's not go too far. I focus on the defense. They aren't the biggest problem. The defense didn't shank a 19-yard punt and mishandle a hold by Colton Boomer. That's on Mitch McCarthy. I'm not going to blame Colton Boomer for missing a 50-something yarder that was that would have been good from 51 and wasn't from 59. Let's let's right. let's yeah. stop acting like that. You know, Colton Boomer's leg was featured in the movie Sniper. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, it wasn't the it wasn't the Idaho thin air. <laughs> oh well, yeah, I, I, I listen as much as people poo poo that I, I'm with that altitude matters. Listen, another UCF guy, um, whose name escapes me immediately, but that's the guy that missed the field missed the field goal in Memphis at the Honolulu Bowl. Uh, Matt Prater, there we right. go. Yeah, at one point held the NFL record in field goals. Helped that he was kicking for one Tim Tebow in Denver, Denver. right? And, you know, thin air is a thing. Yes. Um, and, and uh, with all that coming together, the offense turns the ball over. The offense sputters. Granted, for the first half and half a quarter, right? Call it, let's do some math. Call it the first 22, uh, no, excuse me, 37 minutes of the game. I left a quarter out there in my math, yeah. right? They were they weren't in control necessarily, but they were dominating and doing what they were doing. The only reason why they weren't on the field more is because they were hitting home runs. Props to Johnny Richardson for that opening touchdown, which was beautiful, mm -hmm. right? Then the time of the the one quarter, you could probably answer this question on yourself, Jeff, uh, on your own, Jeff Allen. You're a smart guy. The one quarter where Baylor has a higher time of possession only by uh, like about 30 seconds is that fourth quarter with 26 straight. They, too, got a fast score, by the way. Anybody who's questioning the Wildcat call, which, to me, I didn't love it there, but we're only talking about that because the ball got fumbled. That ain't the question. To those saying, oh, the defense, I listed the things they didn't do. The, to, to the people saying, oh, that interception by Timmy. Well, Gus says post game he runs a play that's called for uh, – uh, illegal formation that he claims to be quote, run, run, running, and I quote, since 1996. And that night, it was called to cancel out a big game that then led to the third and long where Timmy McClain threw the interception. Am I making excuses? No, I'm just going through the long list of stuff 
That had to go wrong for UCF. And oh, by the way, like I mentioned earlier, Baylor's trying to win the darn game. They and got- they made it, and, and to their credit, they made adjustments. Exactly. Well, actually, you argue adjustments. My question is, why didn't they come out with it? Did they not watch the K-State game? Clearly <laughs> they did. Otherwise, they wouldn't have done what they'd done late, right? Mm-hmm. Or maybe they just like, well, hey, you know, it's not like they're going to go up by, on us by like 28 points or anything. Oh, God. You know, yeah. that, that's a thing that happened. We got to give that respect, too, right? Yeah, the, the part that's getting left out, if UCF is so allegedly fraudulent, how come they came out? and dominated the way they did with Baylor with their starting quarterback, right? The way, And I said this I said this on the Night Shift podcast going into the Baylor game. We don't know if they're bad. Their starting quarterback was out. They played uh, Utah within a touchdown, who we're now fa- finding out may not be everything that everybody wants to tell you, even though they're ranked entirely too high. Whole other question. We're focused on UCF right now, Jeff Allen. Mm-hmm. But, but with all that in mind, they got their starting quarterback back, and guess what? They actually performed. <laughs> what? Yeah. You know, it, 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 I think a, a series of unfortunate events doesn't begin to cover this. That was also true of the Boise State game, Jeff, with one distinct, distinct difference. They actually won the dang thing. Mm-hmm. If this game did get one like it was supposed to, we're not having this conversation. Yeah. And, of course, you know, how many times have you seen a big comeback happen, get started with the running game? Yeah. It happens more often than you think. <laughs> right. And, and and listen, games don't in, in, in a half. And, and I think, like a guy like said, that's that lesson. They got too comfortable with the Villanova and the Kent State. And, oh, well, we're up big, so it was just like that. Mm, not what happened here, yeah. you know. Yeah, well, let's look at this week. You know, they they get Kansas. They got uh, manhandled by uh, by the Longhorns this last weekend, but they get their quarterback Jalen Daniels back, which is a uh, you know that's a game changer for them, obviously. So, uh, and it's a Big Twelve road game. You, you know, know, what is this whole thing with opposing quarterback quarterbacks allegedly being out on near or before and then showing up to play against UCF? This is week three of this, Jeff Allen. Right, yeah, we're we're, 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 we're limp all over the field, Byron Leftwich style. <laughs> you know, we're a medical miracle. <laughs> something. <laughs> you have leg pains. Try playing UCF. Yes, playing UCF will bring you back to starting four. You know. Oh gosh. The side effects could include. Yes. <laughs> 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 yes. <laughs> yeah. So, you know that. So the work doesn't get any easier moving forward. Right. You know well, and. and I'll, I'll say this, my expectation, Jeff Allen, was a bowl game for this group. You know, that only takes six wins. You're a smart guy. You, you do math. I do um, math, yes. Right. You know, the fact that they were in a position to, to be favored by Baylor in the first place is one as a fan and somebody, well, I mean, I don't call myself in, but if you are a UCF fan, you know, that is something that's a long way coming from you know, maction. Okay. Mm-hmm. Like, that's a thing, y'all. Yeah, for sure. Um, so yeah, you know, and, and we knew, I mean, anybody thinking we we're going to run in and dominate the big 12, you know, was, you know, that's, you know, that's good stuff if you can smoke it. Right. So, but, uh, <laughs> right. Hey, listen, I would have told us, told you the same thing. If you told me we were leading the game twice against Kansas state. Right. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely true. I think we have the backup quarterback. I, I forgot to mention that part too. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, again, I think we can compete. You yeah. know, the, yeah, we're not going we're not going in and getting getting just totally hammered, but uh but yeah, it is it is a it is a tough uh it is a tough sled to ride. So, uh let's uh, move to another uh avenue that you cover. The oh, NFL. yeah, I didn't get a chance to talk about the O-line yet. I feel like I neglected something. The one group we didn't talk about for UCF is the offensive line. That yeah. in itself is good news. Yes, <laughs> yeah. No, that's a, definitely a step in the right direction. So, yes, the, yeah. It, it's just like good officiating, right? If you don't know, notice the refs, the job is being done well. <laughs> so, yeah. I, yeah. Tell what you, it is, man. There you go. All right. So, moving to the NFL, the team you cover, the Jacksonville Jaguars. So, uh when did, when's the captain going to spring for you to go to London, by the way? <laughs> Actually, there was a plan for me and the wife to go to London, but let's just say the logistics of waiting for credentialing from an NFL uh, franchise, no disrespect to the Jags, 
all NFL franchises and events do kind of wait till closer to the event. My wife will not play an international travel in two weeks. That's not going to happen. So nah, okay. <laughs> that, um, let's just say that paranoia and other turns of unfortunate events or fortunate that we finally get the construction moving. It just happened to work out that it was better to skip it next year. But hey, listen, if I'm still doing the thing, don't be surprised if the Jaguar report gets me credential. They're not sending me. It'll still be on my dime. Whole other question. Yeah. Well, still think you should get the captain to pay for it, but that's just a whole nother, that's a whole nother matter. <laughs> you can certainly try. <laughs> All right. So uh, they go overseas. They beat the Falcons, uh, you know, and that was a big win coming off a tough, a tough loss to the Texans. Uh, what's your, what's your uh, take on the Jag season so far? You know, I, I can see why uh, the Duval devout, as I've grown to call them is, is, is disappointed. They, they expected to come out and listen, that Texan game, for one, came down to two blown coverages, and then you give up a touchdown on a kick return to a fullback. That's just a bad day. These things happen in the NFL. Um, they didn't play necessarily great against the Colts. They hold on. That's what teams that are growing into greatness do. Um, their biggest problem, Jeff, is just starting relatively flat. I don't feel like they did that against the Falcons offensively. That's a good thing. But I'm going to narrow it to this. Jeff, that Falcons win was on the defense. And for all the talk we're hearing about Trevor Lawrence is the prince that is promised, not by me. I didn't Listen, I'm not Peter King. I'm not uh, Travis Holmes. I'm not any of these uh, Jags, uh, what's his word, promoters that are saying 13 wins for them never have, never did. But I'm on record September 30th. Oh, I'm the student of game podcast, by the way. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, that uh, <laughs> That the Jags were going to win the division with 10. Still an improvement from last year, arguably a harder schedule, whatever. But mm. this, this, this is this is going to be a wacky division. Heck, I had the Texans winning seven games. Didn't think the Jack that Jags game was going to be one of them. Here's a funny stat though for you: five past five years, this year included. So right, so the previous four years and this year, the, the Houston Texans' first win has been the Jaguars. Ah, uh, okay. So oh, got the number thing. <laughs> bad juju. Listen, and as it stood, the Jags came out breaking some bad juju. It would have been, let's put it this way, after the opening week this year in Indianapolis, Jeff, two for 11, two for the past 11 at Lucas Oil have been the Jags. So divisional divisional contests, am yeah. I right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, that's absolutely true. That is absolutely true. And, uh, you know, and the Texans are kind of a little sneaky good. You know, I, I, listen, I have them winning seven games. CJ Stroud's awesome. I would like to see them have more receiving weapons. Will Anderson's kind of a dude, you know, um, the dude abides unless you're a quarterback and then he's going to tackle you. Yeah. But um, listen, I, I, I think the Texans are going to do some damage. Um, they're not going to make the playoffs. I know I know uh, some uh, Texas Texan proud are starting to clamor that horn, kind of like Jacksonville fans did last year. Now, granted, eventually I would be proven wrong last year. It was always the Jags. That's what they'll tell me. But uh, the Texans, I just, they have, they've had too many injuries. And I think the schedule gets too, too difficult moving forward to really maintain that. But listen, D'Amico Ryans is doing things, that, uh, things as a coach. And those picks that I mentioned, um, among the others, uh, with CJ Stroud and Will Anderson, have just been fantastic. Yeah. Well, yeah, they'll definitely be a hard, a hard out later in the season for people to, they're, they're just not going to walk in and roll over. So <laughs> CJ Stroud is going to be there a minute. He's going to be a problem. Like maybe Deshaun Watson should have been, if it wasn't for his <clears throat> transgressions. Shall yes. We say. Yes, absolutely. All right. So you got to explain something to me. What is this Duval thing? Because I don't know of any other professional sports franchise that yells their County name. <laughs> like like they do in Jacksonville. So, like, you know, the magic, are, everybody goes, orange! <laughs> <laughs> well, for one, shouting out a color is awkward, especially if the Suns happen to be in town. That might be a problem. Um, but yeah, with Duval, first of all, I, I don't know how much you know about the, the Florida geography. You, probably, you may know this. I won't say probably. I want to put you on the spot. You may know this, but, like, Duval County is basically Jacksonville proper it's lined similarly. Like the locals know this. This is yeah. why you claim to be the biggest city in land area. Your city's land area is marked as an entire damn county. Okay. You're seated. 
<laughs> um, but there's some other cultural aspects there too and, and you know talking to my uh co-host with the uh, duval dive travis holmes of bigcatcountry.com ucf alum by the way all the right guy who, he, he's proud of it because he got to play with a lot of players but he was the guy when he got hurt that joe burnett came in unfortunately travis didn't get his job back after that but he understands why he's very he's very adjusted to it um I say all that to say he explains to me too that there's kind of a hip hop cultural thing connected to Duval as well. Um, listen, I know that I hang out with old school jams all the time and old school 101.com, but I'm not prepared. Thank you, sir. I'm not prepared <laughs> to um, speak to that part too much. I just know that that's an element. And then it's just the whole thing the team's kind of leaned in and embraced, and it's become a community thing. It's evolved into the being uh, the Jags being part of that local culture. Yeah, Duval is definitely unique. There's no question. I be, I even heard when I was playing semi-pro ball, the Jacks, the team out of Jacksonville there would do that at their games too. So that's a whole other thing as well. Wow. Oh, okay. So they have, yeah, okay. Well, there's, there's always more to the story. So that's why I had to ask. So. <laughs> and there's even more than that. Listen, <laughs> you know, Dr. Google will get, will take you places I even couldn't, but that's what I knew about <laughs> All right, so uh, you and I are going to be on opposite sides of the fence this weekend, Cowboys and 49ers uh, squaring off. And uh, i tell you what I, why I have extra keen interest in this game, because I really want to see where the Cowboys are at, because Ooh, this, is really, this, like this is really the first good team they're going to play. <clears throat> you know, they're, they're th- you know, their three wins, it's like 118 to 13. <laughs> in 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 the in the deficit there, but you know they're playing the Giants. I mean, you know, we won't get the into pa- the, the Patriots. And- yeah, the the Patriots oh, aren't. Yeah, the Patriot Patriots are not a good team. You know, by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, you know, and Arizona, that's like the house of horrors for them. That's like the uh, the Tulsa in UCF's the world. Plumber was scary to them in the nineties. I'm saying, right? Yes. Yeah. So they they never play well there, and they probably ate a little bit of the cheese after going two and oh, I think too. Uh, yeah. Well, and the Cardinals were supposed to be bad. Like poor Josh Dobbs keeps getting handed these garbage situations and plays awesome football. It just doesn't yeah. make any sense to me. Oh no, they could have, they could have easily been three and oh in their first three games. Mm-hmm. You know, they were right yeah. there. You know, they are right there. So hey, listen, I, I have no idea how they lost to the red tail. Sorry, commanders. <laughs> yeah, but I think Eric, the enemy had something to do with that. Yes. yes. I said Eric Bieniemy, not that other guy who claims he's the head coach. But shall we continue? <laughs> Absolutely. So, yeah, I want to see where the Cowboys are at because I think you know the Niners, the Eagles are right now the 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 teams that are the standard at the top. I think. Sure. Uh, so I'm curious to see what will happen in this game. I, and I'll put it this way: I don't know how much. Trayvon Diggs would have mattered in this particular game. It's not like the Niners sling it all over the field. It's not like he's covering George Kittle. Maybe he'd come up to uh, handle Ayuk or, 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 or uh, CMC, the man they call Christian McCaffrey. Um, loved watching his dad play too. Um, yeah, easy head. Yep. Yeah. 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 But um, the, for me, here's, here's why it's going well for the Cowboys. And, and, and it's funny for all the times that Mike McCarthy was chided for stale coaching with Aaron Charles Rogers. Oh, you do this wrong. You do this wrong. You're too conservative. That's exactly the offense that the Cowboys need now. And guess what? With Kellen Moore and actually a spot that works out for him, trust me, this di- the divorce of Kellen Moore, an offensive coordinator from the Cowboys to the Chargers was what they both needed, man. Mm-hmm. Because now – the off the offense for the Cowboys is actually running the damn ball. Listen, I watched Pollard in the days where Coach Novell, who now has success at FSU there, was just hating life with anything from Orlando college-wise. Mm-hmm. Everybody knows Darrell Henderson from those days, but Pollard was the second back, and he was still awesome. I, yes. I, you know, I was watching him handle business before, and when Zeke started to decline, fair or not, the NFL is a business. Zeke was making too much money, money and Pollard was tam- too much damn uh, bang for the buck to mm. say no to when they're actually running him this year, Jeff. That's why they're doing better. The defense is great. Don't get it twisted. Yeah. But you got to put points on the board, as the Cardinals game probably implied. Yes. And 
you know, running the football was the way you handle that. Yeah. They definitely have to fix their red zone efficiency. Uh, mm -hmm. That's that that is that something that has to get fixed. But you are right. They're running the ball. They're controlling clock. They're letting their defense work for them. You know, they're you know, I don't like settling for three, but you know, looks like they got a kicker. So you know, <laughs> you know, so you know, you get to, you know, you, you get some points, and your your defense uh, does the work. So yeah, it, it's uh. Like after the Giants game, like you know what? If you tell me my you, if you tell me my defense is gonna you know maybe score once or twice a game, and Dak throws for two hundred and twenty five yards, and we win, I'll take that all the time. Oh yeah, I mean listen, it's a model that's proven proven before. May I introduce to you the Forty ers <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know, sometimes that's one of those things, you know, the uh, the 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 form of flattery, and hmm, that's working for them. Maybe we ought to do that. So, well, you know, and it's funny you, you say that, and I won't. I'm not here to tell you that you're wrong. After all, who was it that ended up with Trey Lance? Am I right? Yeah. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, Trey Lance asked to get traded. Jarrah threw up that fourth round pick. The rest is history, right? Um, but. I think with the Cowboys, too, they've been morphing into being a defense first team for some time. I just don't think they really knew it yet, right? Back when Demarcus Lawrence was the thing. Mm -hmm. And and then, you know, um, I, 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 I hate that this is how I, I don't remember his name perfectly, but I hate that this is how I, the guy that was always hurt, Lee. Sean Lee. Uh, Sean Lee. Sean yeah. Lee, yeah. When he was on the field he with Demarcus beast. Lawrence, brilliant, you know. Um, uh, Roy Williams at safety was a big deal there for a bit. And, and they started getting some of these stars in defensively as of, others of, you know, once Des Bryant, Tony Romo are out, you have Dakota and he's doing his thing. And, and, you know, then you get Zeke in a great offensive line, you know, now you're trying to pound the rock because you have this, you suddenly changed from that team that was, you know, known and loved as one that was trying to, you know, Move, do it in the air with Romo to being more of that defer, defense first style team. I mean, I'm not saying they're the 90s Cowboys that had the three Super Bowls, but I am saying that they're trying to move towards that style and they're finally embracing it fully, I feel like. that We're just now getting him. Mike McCarthy might have arguably helped make that happen. Um, and, and you get a, and you and you end up getting a stud like Micah Parsons and Dan that's Quinn. That's what sealed the deal, exactly. Yeah. And Dan Quinn is a great defensive coach. I mean, I think that track <clears> record <throat> is very well proven. So, a hundred percent. I mean, that's a dude that almost. Oh wait, no, I, I almost got to mix up with Todd Bowles. I almost screwed that up. But, I, <laughs> but Todd Bowles is the guy that almost got to the playoffs with um, uh, Fitzpatrick, and he's a defensive coach that does well. You know, it, it's the same sort of ilk. Yeah, no question. So. Interestingly enough, I'll ask you for some other what you think are great storylines in the league this year, but I find it, I always go back to the NFL as a week-to-week -week business, right? One week, the Dolphins throw a 70-burger up. The next week, they almost give up a 50-burger. <laughs> yeah, isn't that crazy? Um, you know, here, here's, what, here's, why, here's why that happened, is that defense hasn't, hadn't really been tested like that. And, and really, the reason for that has nothing to do with Josh Allen. Because typically, if the ball's in Miami's hands, you see what typically happens. They're going to sit back in coverage and make you run it. And it just happened to work out that the Dolphins are, or excuse me, that the Broncos are awful. Um, you know, it, it's funny. People see that Dolphins game are all up in Sean Payton's business, where the other example of a team being that bad when a new coach took over was one Brian Flores when he started his five year mission. It didn't last five years, albeit. That was just the length of the contract, but his five-year mission to seek out new life and new notoriety to actually be relevant in a way they haven't been in half a decade. And then the music would play. <laughs> Classic, not the, not the, not the uh, other version, because, you know, apparently Flores was much more like Captain Kirk and that he wasn't all that likable. But <laughs> now that the Jean-Luc Picard, that is Josh McDaniel, Make sure you hit that L hard because if you put an S on it and it's Josh McDaniels and the S is for socks. Anyways, but the um, I'm making jokes, Jeff Allen. Yeah, no, I know you know. I know. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm right. I'm right here with you. Oh, there he is. I thought you had a serious look. He was finding the track. Um, but yeah, listen, Mike McDaniel 
the way people talk about Sean McVay, they need to be talking about Mike McDaniel. Um, and Tyreek Hill needs to be an MVP candidate, just like Saquon Barkley should have been last year, right? And we, we what, what happened in that Buffalo game, and, and I wrote it off because I was told how fast Tua Tunga Bailoa gets rid of the ball, two point something seconds or whatever. It's amazing. It really is. But I also forgot about Ed Oliver in that defensive tackle decor that's with the Bills. I watched Ed Oliver in Houston going back to UCF. See how we're tying it all in, all in there nope. for you, Tim Allen? Yep. But, but um, and, and I underestimated that defensive tackle core, and they were the difference in the, in the football game. Yeah. You know, I don't know if you can hear this or not, but um, see if it'll queue up or not. Oh, we're, we're getting we're getting experimental here on the Jeff Allen podcast. Okay. You hear that? I don't. I'm sorry. Okay. I was trying to lo- load up the Star Trek thing. Oh no! I didn't have I, a, I didn't I didn't have it loaded on my board, so I had trying to pull it in another way. Well, anyway. Next time you think you're going to bring up Brian, Brian Flores, get that thing up. Yes, good. I yes, I will do that. <laughs> and, of course, and of course, this will probably be the last time I talk about Brian Flores. <laughs> Who knows? What is lawsuit? <laughs> <laughs> oh, there you go. But yeah, and, but yeah, but going back to you know the week to week business of the NFL, and my audience is already tired of hearing me say it, uh, but I will say it every week in the NFL season. It's, uh, it's from the great Brad Sham, voice of the Dallas Cowboys. Last week hasn't met this week, and they're never going to meet. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a fair take. And actually, the reason why I think that works last week is <laughs> they're never going to meet. Here's the thing. Your hope is that your predic- predictions in the end of the season meet. That's why I don't freak out every week. Yeah. Was I happy that the Titans beat the Bengals, for example? No, I wasn't, because I think they're going to win seven games. But there's still plenty of time for them to blow it. <laughs> you know, conversely, um, you, you know, there's still time for the Bengals also to turn around. I don't know that they will because just the whole situation with Joe Burr, Joey Burr and all that, but, it, it, you know, it, it's it's a tough thing to absorb. Do we think the Dolphins are done now that they lost to Josh Allen and the Bills? No. No. But now we're also trying to be told that the Bills are the best team in the AFC. I'm not sold on that either. Do they have the highest ceiling? Yes. Are they most consistent? Huh. Listen, get that laugh track back out, Jeff, if you think that. <laughs> you know. Yes. Oh, he, he took me literally. I like it. Yeah. You know, I, I'm coachable. What can I tell you? All <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. So what other storylines so far in the first almost quarter of the NFL season – have intrigued you yeah um i'm you know the 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 one that that's still the biggest mystery in the nfl is the rams like what what are we doing they're beating good teams what are we talking about what what just happened what's going on they're competing with the 49ers the closest game now granted division game physics apply Mm -hmm. but what that wasn't supposed to happen heck people started questioning for oh the rams listen Apparently, when John Matthew Stafford isn't sore or injured, he can do things still. Check that out. It's almost like he won a Super Bowl and threw 5,000 yards in a season one time without Calvin Johnson. But nobody wants to talk about that. Just saying, Jeff. But um, I would be remiss if I didn't bring up C.J. Stroud, what he's doing. I think Anthony Richardson's doing great starting at quarterback. I think both those guys who weren't the favorite picks are doing the best. I think C.J. Stroud is breaking the curse of the Ohio State quarterback. Um, I think Brandon Staley is out like a fat kid in dodgeball with the Chargers and the missed opportunity that is that franchise this season. How about that? Yeah. And not just because I watched them collapse in person from a 27 and nothing deficit uh, or or sorry, lead in Duval, such as it was. Yes. Okay. Well, you know, I, I've, I was determined to get this done. I think I have. Oh, see, I hate YouTube sometimes. <laughs> they, they slid a commercial in on me. Come on, man. <laughs> Someone got to get paid, Jeff Allen. Yeah, I guess that's that's one way. That's one way to put it. Uh, all right, I'll shelve that idea. So, 
little producing on the run. Sometimes <laughs> it doesn't, it, it, it fails. I can, I can edit this out or I can't, you, who knows? <laughs> I'm, I'm a pretty funny guy, Jeff Allen. Yes, I know. <laughs> I know that I do know. All right. So you're also covering the Orlando magic. I am. Yes. I am. Yeah. So you get to educate me fully on this because I haven't been a huge NBA guy in the last few years. Right. So, and the Magic certainly have not been worthy of following <laughs> really closely uh, as yeah, a fan. Not, 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 uh, since, not since DJ Augustine hit that three to win game one against the Raptors. It's been a minute. Yes, it's been, it's been a little while. So talk to me about this year's Orlando Magic franchise. Are they truly indeed an up-and-comer? Are they playoff potential? What's your take? Well, uh, and, and, you know, because I'm relatively new to the team, I'll, I'll go with things that I've observed, you know, thus far. And as I dig, dig there, you know, you'll hear more moving forward, um, you know, through A7B and sports. But um, Cole Anthony, I think, answers one of your questions pretty directly. He was asked if this was the best friend, uh, sorry, best roster he's seen. And he says, yeah. I haven't seen a roster this good since my rookie year was his answer. Now, here's the thing. And, and as I say this, Orlando Magic fans are going to kind of twitch and shudder and come into a cold sweat. And I know why. And it's a history going back to Grant Hill and maybe other things too. But Markel Fultz and Jonathan Isaac must remain healthy. And this is a thing they haven't done since Vooch was traded away. A good trade, by the way. I'm, I'm not dissing it. I miss Vooch because he was a cool guy and, and, and you know, did his job. Yes. Who, who was a big man that's not named um, Giannis or Jokovic gets to the All-Star game as an actual threat to make a play. Oh, and Joel Embiid, excuse me, right? Yes. You know, the list of big men that are prominent isn't long. I mean, heck, even Carl Anthony Towns is a seven-footer, but he this dude chucks up threes uh, from the cheap seats at a great clip for a big guy. It's not Dirk Nowitzki frequent, but, you know, it's a lot, right? So um, from that standpoint, yeah, they're going to they're gonna try to do that small ball thing. They're going to try to do that uh, Steve Nash, Phoenix Suns kind of, you know, mobility thing, which could set up injury potential because of all that running, obviously. But um, – there's a friend of my good friend, uh, EJ Christian, whose show I just did today, the earnestly speaking podcast. He claims himself, thank you, sir. He claims himself a basketball guy. He's a heat fan and says that the Orlando magic are one of his more are in his top 10 most intriguing teams this season. So that should tell you plenty. Yeah, that's uh, that is interesting. Um, you know, and, and Jamal Mosley. So, which, what's a, what what is he's considered? Is he considered a player's coach? He's you know what's what's the yeah the dynamic there? The, yeah, I think I think he falls into the player coach um, uh, category, and and you know he's he's he he's going into his third camp, and kind of his approach to it, you know, it's getting those years under your belt. It feels like kind of I, I I get that vibe. He's feeling like he's really focused and moving into it. Cole Anthony always, like I said, always outspoken, ready to do his thing. Um, he's excited. If Cole Anthony's excited, that should tell you something. Because that's kind yeah. of his natural state anyway. <laughs> um, just with what I saw from Paolo Vancaro, rookie of the year, right? Um, there is a year of growth that you can very easily see just in his talking to the media and what, what he's doing for himself, the international uh, stuff he did over the off season here. Same with Mosley too. He, he talked about some lessons he learned from that over media day. Um, but yeah, I, I think I'll put it this way. The days of Nick nurse and, you know, preaching defense, obviously this team's going to still try to play some defense when they can. Sure. But um, being more of a stickler, more concentrating on defense, uh, Jamal Mosley's not this guy, right? I think we've seen that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, it'll be interesting to watch. Uh, you know how was how was uh, how was media day? Man, listen, I, I uh, I'll put it this way: I put some stuff out, you know, through the Student of the Game Facebook page and Twitter accounts, the SOTG on Instagram, the SOTG, all that other stuff, and and it was drinking from my fire hose. I never really expected experienced anything quite like that with the NBA, but I mean that's kind of what media is media day is too. I mean, this time next week. 
I'll be at UCF basketball media day before they do the one for the Big 12 conference in Kansas. So, you know, I'll, I'll have some more help for that one with my black and gold banneret guys. But listen, man, uh, it's it's always fun to do media days in general because there's just so much going on. And all the nicest people show up, you know, and mm-hmm. eventually the captain makes it too. Yeah. So, yeah, I think, yes, I, yeah. Just some interesting. He he he's kind of showing up at marquee stuff there, doesn't he? He's is he? I mean, listen, yeah. he's 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 embracing the captain. Isn't just a clever nickname, Jeff Allen. <laughs> That's for sure. Um, so, how were the players? I mean, were they were they were they loose? Were they kind of you know kind of into joking around, having fun? <laughs> you know, was it, it all was, serious talk? What, what, how how was that? It, it was funny. Um, I um. While Wendell Carter Jr. was talking, Markel Fultz kind of came up into the scrum and just, he didn't say anything, he didn't ask questions, he just kind of gave that menacing look and, and you know, Wendell Carter started laughing at it. And, you know, it's it's fun, like, stuff like that. But the general energy of what's going on, you know, we media types are asking about uh, players about contract years, and they said, I'm not worried about that right now. I actually kind of believed them when they said it because the other common thing I heard them say throughout media day, Jeff Allen, was the fact that they had not yet seen playoffs. Playoff? Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. I know it's a different sport, but they might as well be Jim Morris Sr. talking about playoffs with the Lions back then, right? Yep. This group believes that it's possible, though, right? We believe in magic isn't just some clever tagline now. The players are vested in that with the playoffs such as they are as well. And listen, it was a lot of fun. It was later last month. The 35-year anniversary stuff, we had Bo Outlaw show up. <laughs> Excuse me. You had um, uh, Hito Turgaloo, Rashad Lewis, Nick Anderson, uh, you know, there talking about the 35 years and 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 having moments and all like that. Um, Suggs came out and was the one introduced, you know, wearing the new uniform and just being there. He's all soaking it up. I can only imagine that energy from the guys. I mean, Bo Outlaw already has a lot of energy. That dude. Oh yeah. <laughs> but, um, I, I, this is, I see, I've seen belief in a team before. Hey, listen, you know, try talking to the Jaguars going to that playoff game, like I said, uh, against the Chargers. I've seen belief in players before in professional athletes and college athletes. And when they were talking, it looked like belief. They weren't just there as an obligation to go through a mediocre season. They think they can make it to the playoffs. Yeah. Interesting, uh, you know, because, yeah, it's, 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 it's hard to believe 35 years, like, just five years ago, I did a series on the 30 years, uh, you know, interviewing people that covered the team back in the day, like, you know, Barry Cooper, who was the original beat writer from the Atlanta <laughs> Sentinel, Greg Warmoth of Channel 9, who was in sports at the time, uh, you know, folks like that. So I, I may replay some of that stuff. I may try to do some uh, additional interviews on top of that uh, since it's now five years later. Hard to believe, but uh, yeah. it, it is a, it is incredible that it's been that long now. It's still a very short sports life compared to other, you know, professional well, franchises. Right here, though, in that short time, Jeff Allen, like, listen, that's, I mean, they, they've been to the finals more than once. Obviously, they haven't won one yet, but um, it's, I'll put it this way. We're out of, we're not in the era anymore where they need a dominant center to do it like they did the two times that they did i'll put it that way <laughs> yes yeah it's a it's a it's a different scenario now and i also also think about you know they had an incredible amount of good fortune in their first few years in the league an oh, incredible the, amount the lottery picks right you know and 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 they you know they they hit on their draft picks you know they hit on their free agents they i mean they just it was almost like everything they touched had that golden Midas thing going on. And then you look and say, well, you know, maybe we're paying for that now (laughs) (laughs) through through the 20 teens. It's interesting. It starts and begins with Anthony Hardaway, right? That was the second lottery pick. I still think they should have took Weber, but um, you know what? Well, technically they did. (laughs) I I see what you did. there, But yeah, yeah, I, I, they should have kept, I don't know. And, um, you know, but I think it starts and ends with Hardaway, right? His, his situation such that it is was the first bad fortune with his inability to stay on the floor consistently. After that is Grant Hill. Then, you know, more and more on, down on the line. Now, there's a couple that were just bad decisions. That Turgaloo contract, is, as, as much as I like the guy, that second contract should not have ever happened. 
-hmm. you know, and, and more of those kinds of mistakes have become factors. Getting tied to Tracy McGrady um, with the money and all that, such as that was. Um, the whole Dwight Howard debacle with Stan Van Gundy, you know, there's, it, I, that's an interesting, Ooh, that's a good point you made in the karma paying for it on the other way. So you kind of blowing my mind. I never thought of it that way before. I'm, I'm hijacking your pod, just pondering that. Well, see, well now, now this will keep you up tonight and, I, and you can no, thank me for that. <laughs> All right. Well, Kyle Nash, the student of the game, shameless plugs, rattle them all off. Ready, set, go. <laughs> of course, Jeff, first of all, an honor, joy, and privilege to be on the Jeff Allen Podcast once again. Thank I've you, actually sir. lost count. You've managed to scrape this low down on the barrel to find me to have me aboard. Oh, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, no. That's, you're you're, you're way, much I higher than you, the bar. I don't know. I, I, other than when I ran into you at the UCF basketball game, um, I don't know that I've had the opportunity to say thanks for your contribution to the uh, student of the game real mock draft. That was wow. an overwhelming success. Thanks to you and everybody who was involved, um, who I will not list off because there's that many of them. Anyway. Yes. Um, and, and, I, and, and, and for those who didn't hear it, I did the Drew Pearson style announcement of a draft pick. Listen, y'all head over to the student of the game Facebook page and find it because it was funny. I'm just saying Yes. Um, but yeah, Jeff, thanks for having me on. Of course, I am Kyle Nash, the Stupid Game. You can find me on Twitter at the SOTG. Find me on Instagram as the same, the SOTG. Find me on Facebook as a student of the game. <laughs> then also check out my writings with the Jaguar Report, the three point conversion, and of course, covering Jeff's UCF nights with the black and gold banneret. Then also check out the Student of the Game podcast and the Duval Dive. All you could find as well with everything else with that on A7BN Sports as well. Yeah. There you go. You may have set the record for bell rings on the show. I mean, listen, I, I, they, they call home runs dingers, and I feel like I hit them an awful lot. What can I say? Yeah, good job by you as always. Kyle, thanks again, man. Honor, joy, and privilege, Jeff. But until next time, class dismissed.